Chapter Two of Divers Women by Pansy and Mrs. C. M. Livingston. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sunday Fractures, Chapter Two. Some people who forgot the fourth commandment. Let me introduce to you the Harrison dinner table and the people gathered there on the afternoon of that Sabbath day. Miss Lily had brought home with her her cousin Jim. He was privileged on the score of relationship. Miss Helen, another daughter of the house, had invited Mr. Harvey Latimer. He was second cousin to Kate's husband, and Kate was a niece of Mrs. Harrison. Relationship again. Also, Miss Fanny and Miss Cecilia Lawrence were there, because they were schoolgirls and so lonely in boarding school on Sunday, and their mother was an old friend of Mrs. Harrison. There are always reasons for things." The dinner-table was a marvel of culinary skill. Clearly Mrs. Harrison's cook was not a church-goer. Roast turkey and chicken pie, and all the side-dishes attendant upon both, to say nothing of the rich and carefully prepared dessert, of the nature that indicated that its flakiness was not developed on Saturday, and left to wait for Sunday. Also there was wine on Mrs. Harrison's table just a little homemade wine, the rare juice of the grape prepared by Mrs. Harrison's own cook, not at all the sort of wine that others indulged in. The Harrisons were temperance people. "'I invited Dr. Selmser down to dinner,' remarked Mrs. Harrison, as she sipped her coffee. "'I thought since his wife was gone it would be only common courtesy to invite him in to get a warm dinner. But he declined.' He said his Sunday dinners were always very simple. Be it known to you that Dr. Selmser was Mrs. Harrison's pastor and the preacher of the morning sermon. Miss Lily arched her handsome eyebrows. Oh, Mamma, she said, how could you be guilty of such a sin? The idea of Dr. Selmser going out to dinner on Sunday! I wonder he did not drop down in a faint. Papa, did you ever hear such a sermon? It slashed right and left, that is a fact, said Mr. Harrison, between the mouthfuls of chicken salad and oyster pickle. A little too sweeping in its scope to be wise for one in his position. Have another piece of the turkey, James? He is running into that style a little too much. Some person whose opinion has weight ought to warn him. A minister loses influence pretty rapidly, who meddles with everything. "'Well, there was everything in that sermon,' said Miss Cecilia. "'I just trembled in my shoes at one time. I expected our last escapade in the school-hall would be produced to point one of his morals.' "'You admit that it would have pointed it?' said the cousin Jim, with a meaning laugh. Oh, yes, it was awfully wicked, I'll admit that, but one didn't care to hear it rehearsed in a church. That is the trouble, Mama Harrison said. Little nonsenses that do very well among schoolgirls, or in the way of a frolic, are not suited to illustrate a sermon with. I think Dr. Selmser is rather apt to forget the dignity of the pulpit in his illustrations." Lorena says he utterly spoiled the closing anthem by that doleful hymn he gave out, said Miss Lily. They were going to give that exquisite bit from the last sacred opera, but the organist positively refused to play it after such woe-begone music. I wish we had a new hymn-book, without any of those horrid old-fashioned hymns in it, anyhow. It was Mr. Harvey Latimer's turn to speak. Oh, well, now, say what you please, Selmser can preach. He may not suit one's taste always, especially when you get hit, but he has a tremendous way of putting things. Old Professor Marker says he has more power over language than any preacher in the city. Yes, said Mr. Harrison, struggling with too large a mouthful of turkey. He is a preacher, whatever else may be said about him and yet, of course, it is unfortunate for a minister to be always pitching into people. They get tired of it after a while. "'Jim, did you know that Mrs. Jameson was going to give a reception to the bride next Wednesday evening?' This from Lily. "'No, is she? That will be a grand crush, I suppose.' 
"'I heard her giving informal invitations in church today,' Helen said, and one of the schoolgirls said, "'Oh, don't you think she said she was going to invite us? Cecilia told her to send the invitation to you, Mrs. Harrison. We felt sure you would ask us to your house to spend the evening. Madam Wilcox will always allow that. But there is no use trying to get her permission for a party. You will ask us, won't you?' whereupon Mrs. Harrison laughed and shook her head at them, and told them she was afraid they were naughty girls, and she would have to think about it, all of which seemed to be entirely satisfactory to them. The conversation suddenly changed. "'Wasn't Mrs. Marsh dressed in horrid taste today?' said Helen Harrison. "'Really, I don't see the use in being worth a million in her own right if she has no better taste than that to display.' Her camel's hair shawl is positively the ugliest thing I ever saw, and she had it folded horribly. She is round-shouldered, anyhow, ought never to wear a shawl. "'I think her shawl was better than her hat,' chimed in Miss Lily. "'The idea of that hat costing fifty dollars! It isn't as becoming as her old one, and, to make it look worse than it would have done, she had her hair arranged in that frightful new twist. "'Why, Lily Harrison, I heard you tell her you thought that her hat was lovely.' This from Lily's youngest sister. "'Oh, yes, of course,' said Miss Lily. "'One must say something to people. It wouldn't do to tell her she looked horrid.' And the mother laughed. "'It is a good thing for Mrs. Marsh that she holds her million in her own right.' observed Cousin Jim. That husband of hers is getting a little too fast for comfort. "'Is that so?' Mr. Harrison asked, looking up from his turkey bone. "'Yes, sir. His loss at cards was tremendously heavy last week. Would have broken a less solid man. He had been drinking when he played last, and made horridly flat moves.' "'Disgraceful,' murmured Mr. Harrison and then he took another sip of his homemade wine. There were homes representing this same church that were not so stylish or fashionable or wealthy. Mrs. Brower and her daughter Jenny had to lay aside their best dresses, and all the array of Sunday toilet, which represented their very best, and repair to the kitchen to cook their own Sunday dinners. Was it a thoughtful dwelling upon such verses of Scripture as had been presented that morning, which made the Sunday dinner the most elaborate, the most carefully prepared, and more general in its variety than any other dinner in the week? Their breakfast hour was late, and, by putting the dinner hour at half-past three, it gave them time to be elaborate, according to their definition of that word. Not being cumbered with hired help, mother and daughter could have confidential Sabbath conversations with each other as they worked. So while Mrs. Brower carefully washed and stuffed the two plump chickens, Jenny prepared squash and turnip and potatoes for cooking, planning meanwhile for the hot apple sauce and a side dish or two for dessert, and the two talked. "'Well, did you get an invitation?' the mother asked, and the tone of suppressed motherly anxiety showed that the subject was one of importance." Did she mean an invitation to the great feast which is to be held when they sit down to celebrate the marriage supper of the Lamb, and which this holy Sabbath day was given to help one prepare for? No, on second thought it could not have been that, for, after listening to the morning sermon, no thought of anxiety could have mingled with that question. Assuredly Jenny was invited, nay, urged, entreated. The only point of anxiety could have been, would she accept? But it was another place that filled the minds of both mother and daughter. "'Indeed I did!' There was glee in Miss Jenny's voice. "'I thought I wasn't going to. She went right by me and asked people right and left, never once looking at me. But she came away back after she had gone into the hall, and came over to my seat, and whispered that she had been looking for me all the way out, but had missed me.' She said I must be sure to come, for she depended on us young people to help make the affair less ceremonious. Don't you think Emma wasn't invited at all? And I don't believe she will be. Almost everyone has been now. 
Emma was so sure of her invitation because she was such a friend of Lou Jameson's. She thought she would get cards to the wedding, you know, and when they didn't come she felt sure of the reception. She has been holding her head wonderfully high all the week about it, and now she is left out and I am in. Mother, isn't that rich? Mrs. Brower plumped her chickens into the oven and wiped the flour from her cheek and sighed. There will be no end of fuss in getting you ready, and expense, too. What are you going to wear, anyway? Mother, said Jenny impressively, turning away from her squash to get a view of her mother's face, I ought to have a new dress for this party. I haven't anything fit to be seen. It is months since I have had a new one, and everybody is sick of my old blue dress. I'm sure I am. It is entirely out of the question, Mrs. Brower said irritably, and you know it is. I wonder at your even thinking of such a thing, and we so many bills to pay, and there's that pew rent hasn't been paid in so long that I'm ashamed to go to church. I wish the pew rent was in Jericho, and the pew too, was Miss Jenny's spirited answer. I should think churches ought to be free if nothing else is. It is a great religion, selling pews so high that poor people can't go to church. If I had thought I couldn't have a new dress, I should have declined the invitation at once. I did think it was time for me to have something decent, and I make my own clothes, too, which is more than most any other girls do. I saw a way to make it this morning. I studied Miss Harvey's dress all the while we were standing. I could make trimming precisely like hers, and put it on and all. I could do everything to it but cut and fit it. I tell you, you haven't anything to cut and fit, and can't have. What's the use in talking? And in her annoyance and motherly bitterness at having to disappoint her daughter, Mrs. Brower let fall the glass jar she had been trying to open, and it opened suddenly, disgorging and mingling its contents with bits of glass on the kitchen floor. Does any one, having overheard thus much of the conversation, and having a fair knowledge of human nature, need to be told that there were sharp words bitterly spoken in that kitchen after that, and that presently the speech settled down into silence and gloom, and preparations for the Sunday dinner went on, with much slamming and banging, and quick nervous movements, that but increased the ferment within and the outside difficulties. And yet this mother and daughter had been to church, and heard that wonderful text, "'Take heed what ye do, let the fear of the Lord be upon you,' had listened while it was explained and illustrated, going, you will remember, into the very kitchen for details. They had heard that wonderful hymn, "'In vain my soul would try to shun thy presence, Lord, or flee the notice of thine eye.' Both mother and daughter had their names enrolled in the church record. They were at times earnest and anxious to feel sure that their names were written in the book kept before the throne. Yet the invitation to Mrs. Jameson's reception, informally whispered to the daughter as she moved down the church aisle, had enveloped the rest of their Sabbath in gloom. "'Friend, how earnest thou in hither, not having on the wedding garment!' It was a wedding reception to which Jenny had been invited. Did neither mother nor daughter think of that other wedding, and have a desire to be clothed in the right garment? End of chapter 2